And finally, wrapping up this session, we welcome the panel technical challenges in the operation of community networks. In this panel, we'll listen to three experts that work in uh, the design, implementation, and operation of community networks in Latin America. It will be chaired by Sebastian uh, Schoenfeld. And, well, we give you the floor. You can get started. A round of applause for the, our three speakers. Hello, Filippi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for receiving us here this afternoon. The idea of this panel is, uh, as uh, we were told when we were introduced, is to discuss the uh, community networks and uh, to talk about uh, the specific problems that we face with these uh, operations that uh, are similar to other networks in the Internet, but to, to a great extent they are also different because each of these networks has its own specificities, and we're going to see that. I think that it's interesting. Now I'm going to introduce uh, the people with us. But what we want to do with this panel is not only are we going to listen to the participants, to the experts, but we want uh, to start a dialogue and to have a conversation between you and uh, us uh, up here and, uh, and uh, debate about what those uh, issues are. Hopefully there will be many questions. You, we, uh, we have enough time for that. Let me introduce the people with me today. So, well, we had uh, Felipe there. Felipe Rimes. Is that the way you pronounce your name? Rimes, yes, good. He's the founder of Comored, an initiative that seeks to democratize uh, the use of the internet in peripheral uh, communities. He was born in Niteroi, the Rio de Janeiro, and he operates community networks in Brazil. To my right, to my side, is Christian uh, Miguel Dominguez of the fiber optic, uh, uh, he, he, um, uh, fiber optic technician in Argentina, and um, uh, of, uh, he created the community network Soldati Conectada, and uh, Hector Matilda, who works with audio, video, and cybersecurity, and he's also a member of the local chapter of the Internet Society, and he has worked uh, in the implementation of community networks of their new project. So, what I'm going to, I'm going, let me start by doing something that uh, a chair would not do, but I, I'd like to introduce this topic and, and explain why ISOC is so interested in it. There are 2.6 million people that are not connected to the internet yet, and uh, so we, uh, uh, connectivity is uh, crucial, and we want to connect all those willing to be connected to the Internet. We think that it is absolutely necessary for people's lives at present. And there are some variables, some things that are happening, and we have to find a solution to this problem. And although it, the Internet is growing, it's not so fast. And year after year, there are fewer people, uh, a newcomer, few, fewer newcomers. So we have to find new ways to connect the, the unconnected. So. As you know, we have some traditional models for the implementation of a network by commercial operators that have shown to have certain limits. One third of the world does not have access to a substantial or significant connectivity to access the Internet. And in that universe of complementary solutions, the community networks that are built 
uh, by the communities and for the communities in the terms in which the communities need and want to do it. They've shown to be a complementary solution that is very important because they are accompanied by empowerment and uh, sustainable, local sustainability. In the case, for instance, I see Mariana here with us. And the internet has been an additional need here in a project that had to do with the strengthening communities and not the key variable. But they came to the Internet Society saying, well, the internet is something additional that we need to include in a plan of action that includes many, many factors. And it's important to point that out, and it's ideal for us because there are many, many variables that have to do with promoting community work that uh, we have nothing to do with because we are essentially technical, but those are the needs that indeed make it possible to have these implementations. Our working pillars surrounding the uh, community networks is to implement uh, new uh, um, uh, do new implementations and to promote an enabling uh, environment. Not all the countries in the world have uh, an enabling regulatory framework enabling the networks to exist, and that needs to be corrected. All the countries should have policy promoting uh, internet connections in a community. I promise that this will be over soon, and we'll discuss technical things that are going to be much more fun. So we, there are several ways we can support these developments. We do it through grants that make it possible to deploy infrastructure. We have a kit of do-it-yourself tools. We have support with staff of the Internet Society in the communities that build their own infrastructure. And we seek funds. We do fundraising in many different, with many different uh, sponsors to uh, pursue this uh, development uh, work. This year, for instance, we awarded uh, 10 uh, grants for new or better com community networks around the world. We are not the only organization working at this. We work with them and we try to work with them jointly. This is a map of what the Internet Society has done so far. We are not including the 10 new networks, but we have uh, delivered uh, um, uh, $5 million, 54 communities. Um, the, the funds were $2.5 million. Uh, it, and we'll see the challenges that you have to overcome to reach the users. And these are results of a survey. And I have to do with what happened in these networks that we worked with in recent years. I won't read the statistics because you can read them and I would feel uh, silly to read them. Now, the other issues that we need to do is to develop uh, these, uh, to support the local champions so that they can develop their abilities through courses as IT networks, introduction to uh, network operations, preparing the community for the development of a network. Because sometimes you have people who are ready to deploy the network, but the community is no, not ready. So we need to do a prior work. It takes time. Uh, you need money and effort. And it is essential so that that network may succeed, because not always do they succeed. We always have to say it in this survey. We found that some networks had not succeeded, and they no longer existed. And maybe that is the most important thing that we need to learn, what failed. Because when everything is fine, things are easy. But it's when things go wrong when you can really learn and correct things. Let's go through this quickly, because as I said, we we want these uh, connectivity possibilities to uh, spread and those and we want all those that want to be connected to be able to connect and we try the the, the spectrum that was uh, left uh, by the uh, tv uh, white spaces 
uh, the, the non-licensed aspect of Wi-Fi may be awarded and that they may be awarded for free use and not to be used a, as uh, pirate networks. We want legal networks so that need to be used uh, for a common uh, 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 well, and we do it in CITEL, SEPTA, ATU, ABD, the Arab League, wherever there are people who are not connected, the, uh, the Internet Society goes. There are many results, and I won't read it, because I think it's much more interesting to give uh, the floor to Hector for his presentation. Thank you, Hector. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, show a brief uh, presentation. It starts with some videos. This gives you an idea of what our community network is. Today, you're going to see two community networks in indigenous communities in El Chaco. And this is a project that empowers women that do handicraft and to produce in El Chaco. first community network with access to the internet. This is a community Santa Rosa. This is a new tool for us. We are more than 30 organizations that collaborate together. The development of the internet has to be in the head of communities. Identity, there are public policies. Let us be part in the democratization. So five kilometers around, we have communities, five further centers, we have digital inclusion. This is a dream come true. And this is our second network. Community network, Nivagle, with access to the internet. We're going to be able to provide capacity building to these people. This is what we're working on. This is Nilda De Lorenzo. She's speaking in Guarani. I'm very happy for having received these computers, for being connected to the internet. So despite the high temperatures, we work on fruit gathering. Here we produce, here we have information, here we have work. Here, we take care of the environment. So this is a brief introduction to show you what we have been doing. This is the territory where we work. We have been working for three years now in this project. We started in 2021, and it was rolled out in 2022 and 2023, and the last inauguration was in 2024, this year. So we connect those who are not connected. So the purpose of this project was to take broadband wireless internet to isolated communities. Quite obviously, this is not about quality of service or major ISPs, because the world in which I worked is so different from what we're doing now. These networks are part of a project we called Nanum Connected Women. This consisted in taking digital literacy to six indigenous communities and the surrounding areas in the Chaco of Paraguay. I worked in this project as a technical manager. We collaborated in implementing connectivity and also in the training activities of this community network. This project took place over several years. Uh, in our indigenous communities, 
decisions are made based on consensus. <laughs> when you go to an assembly, the project is proposed and things are defined until consensus is reached regarding what the community wishes to do. The community decided that they wish not only to connect the community center, but also schools and the family health care centers. So we adjusted the project and rolled it out. Of course, we signed a memorandum of understanding with each of these communities because there are several tribes involved. Let us speak first about the community of Com. They live in the Chaco in the area between Paraguay and Argentina. This is quite a big area. This is the first pilot plan with an indigenous community. The location is called Cerrito. It's a suburban area of the town Benjamin Aceval in Presidente Hayes. This is about 500 kilometers away from here. These are 700 families, eight tribes, and they have about 16 schools and one family health care unit. The, the community of Com is a matriarchal family. Women work in handcrafts. They produce bags and weave um, um, hats and other craft work with totora, which is a kind of straw. This is the network. The, for this community network, we used uh, the solution of near city mesh. This is a wireless network, and it has five sites covering a radius of about five kilometers. So we lease the sign, we go to a distribution center, and from there to the five points. Each point additionally has a mesh network which provides connectivity to each of the homes, schools, and other centers in the surrounding area. I will also refer to the town, to the community of Nivacle. This is even further away. It's about 500 kilometers away from Asuncion. This is in the peri-urban area of Irala Fernandez on the border to the district of Loma Plata Boqueron. This is a different type of economy. They produce algarrobo flour. These are produced with the seeds of a tree that grows in the Chaco area. This is a similar community network which is adapted to the topography of the region. This also works in the same way. These networks, the previous network had about 580 single users and a traffic about 80 terabytes. This is a smaller network, has 280 customers and about 1.2 to 1.5 terabytes per month. So this is still a low volume of traffic, but is growing rapidly. In this community, we also installed other connections and compared to the Quam network is the way it is operated. The COM network is closer to Ascension. We had an HP6, and the bandwidth is higher. And in this other case, this was associated to a government project of the government's digital agenda of MITIC. We received a symmetrical connection of 60 megabits per second. What are the challenges? There was no legislation on community networks in Paraguay, so we had to speak with a regulator to tell them that we're going to do an experimental network. So we received that authorization. Negotiation for the infrastructure is difficult. This required dedicating a lot of time to obtain the authorization and approvals because we had to build the towers, we had to seek partnerships to make this network work at a minimum cost. 
Furthermore, we had to use regional resources from the tower vendors as well as local labor to set up the wiring for the power and so on. For the second inauguration of this Nivakle network, Conatel issued a ruling on community networks, specifically for indigenous community networks. So we received the endorsement for the work we had been carrying out with these communities. This network was built specifically for educational purposes. This is for digital evangelization. So the hybrid courses provided over this network are already bearing fruit. We now have a hybrid course on digital skills and content creation. We have to bear in mind that many of the users are illiterate, so the way they communicate is directly through audio and video options. These are different images where we have set up the network. Each site has its specificities. As you can see, the nodes are quite remote in some of the cases. These are some images of this community using the system and offering these courses, because that is the ultimate goal of this effort. So we're going to have a look at the other presentations, and then we can answer to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hector. I'm taking note for some questions. I don't want to ask the questions now. I'll keep these for later, and I'll give the floor to Felipe. Felipe, you can manage your own presentation. You have the floor now. Over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and to make this presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. As I was saying, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you something about the reality we have in Brazil. I'm Felipe Rimes. I am founder and manager of this community network called Como Rede. Como Rede is a technology with free and accessible community technologies. Here we deal with issues, with the recurrent issues, which is water supply, which is very irregular in the peripheral area. We are from a location that is fondly called as Kung Fu Siki Stao, which is a reference to those countries that live in war. We also have our own wars in Rio de Janeiro. This is, of course, a different context. But even so, we suffer from lack of water supply, lack of internet access, of course, and so many things that are lacking in these settlements. This also includes power supply, or it is low quality power supply. And these are very big problems and cannot be solved by private initiatives or public initiatives. I was born in these areas. I have been working for many decades now with these technologies and with open source software. I managed to identify that we could use the technologies to tackle some of these problems. It might seem like a story, but it is a reality. This is a community that is organized to use resources, for example, when there is more availability of water. I was aware that I could wash my clothes or wash the dog. And I was listening to the machine my neighbor was using. So through these open technologies, I said, let us publish this information 
so that we can develop a solution altogether and we can notify the inhabitants when we have uh, rainfall. We send an SMS. This allows us to do monitoring of power supply and water supply. Whenever we have rainfall, we, ish, we send out an alert. We say, now we have water. You will see that this alert comes hand in hand with publicity on the neighborhood. So this is what helps us sustain our community. Some academics might call this a shared value chain, but in this settlement in the peripheral area, this is work we have to do for us and on our own. So we ran this pilot study in a location with 75 homes. We validated the technological aspects, the technical aspects. There is a cultural issue here because this community embraced this platform, understood the value it has. We have an issue that has to do with the market. The market is quite relevant in size. So we worked together to have an interesting product. Now, the people who live in peripheral areas, this is data from 2013, but we know that there are 12 million inhabitants living in peripheral areas in Brazil, 1.7 million inhabitants in Rio, in favelas, and 43% live in precarious types of housing. So these are concepts of precarious types of housing. This is access that is almost to internet that is almost non-existent. We have a platform with routers in the homes of the users. We developed sensors to connect these to the hydrometer. These are 300 to 500 reales in cost. And to compare this, you can also do this for 2,000 reales. And they don't work like ours do. Ours work far better, and it's much cheaper. Uh, most of you must already know this, but when uh, um, uh, somebody connects to the Wi-Fi, they are uh, forwarded to a uh, uh, home page, as home, uh, home site, uh, as if it were a hotel. And there, you need to accept and uh, to use the internet. But you can also register your name and uh, your telephone to receive alerts. For instance, where uh, there's. Um, when uh, w with information about the neighborhood as uh, so as to create a virtuous cycle in the community the uh, the people that live there also have access to a chart to see uh, for instance uh, how much what uh, it rained in the last uh, 7 days to to have an idea of the availability of resources both of water and energy uh, so that they can um uh, get in touch with the people responsible for those uh, utilities. We looked for a, a business model. The cost is less than eight reales per inhabitant, despite the fact that they use both the internet and they receive uh, the alerts. And we propose not just a community network, but all those that want to operate the alert and announcement system. Well, we say that there may be a 50 percent uh, uh, gain or a profit in the messages and the problem of water supply in Brazil, for instance, in spite of the fact that uh, the uh, water is considered an essential resource uh, uh, in uh, um, in 2017, uh, Brazil lost 11.3 billion uh, reales in the distribution of water. Um, in the grid, we have a competitive advantage in these platforms through proprietary solutions. For instance, the open source uh, hardware and uh, software. Those of you interested in uh, this kind of data, here you have them. It's a uh, it's a paradigm shift or or rupture because it's not a, a, a public platform. It's private 
platform. It, and it's for the common uh, good for for everybody. And uh, you can help other communities uh, solve their problems too. As to the technical, uh, there are operational problems that we have that are reflected uh, because of our reality. In Brazil, we'd like to talk about uh, a triad of technology, people, and processes. I can speak uh, in my own name, but sometimes we exchange with other community managers, and we feel as if this were a house of cards where that can tumble down any time. But we can build infrastructure that may be stronger, more robust, more resilient, and here to the in the process of, uh, well the the aim is to be self sustainable we need to have financial resources not necessarily financial not uh, just uh, high value checks uh, but uh, smaller uh, checks but uh, that are recurrent so that we can support all these social projects so the development we are speaking of codes of uh, the uh, uh, labor that is more uh, scarce we need uh, the check to come in a high value the second in second we need we have security regulatory and legal aspects and also the physical aspects we need security in all those uh, environments essentially mainly if we act in uh, the periphery a third uh, item is being autonomous. We wanted uh, to uh, uh, maintain uh, the uh, engagement with the community and to make it easier for the uh, community to uh, to start uh, making um, managing the uh, um, the internet on themselves. And the other is uh, the programmed uh, obsoles obsolescence. The um, machines. Uh, uh, go obsolete and we need for a constant development and even the programming language used to create platforms needs to be updated. As to the people, as a fifth uh, problem or pain, we have knowledge management. So these are pains that, uh, well, they are cross, they, they are in all uh, the, uh, the fields. So we need uh, to have a the the intellectual uh, capital that we uh, create in one uh, community, this needs to be uh, shared in the community. Well, this is our team. Some uh, of the collaborators are older, others uh, are newcomers, and our strategy, our market strategy, is to be able to scale up this project, is working with NGOs and donating, for instance, donating kits and to train uh, people to do the same job. And in the private sector, through the RCE uh, area, RSC areas, we, we also try to uh, find people. And we want to promote uh, public incentives. We are a uh, civil social organization an SEO, and uh, the idea is to work together with the municipalities and with uh, the uh, state. And we are also working to reach public policy at a federal level. If you want to learn more about uh, our network and how it works, we are uh, there in the network, and we have interesting material. I want to thank LACNIC for this opportunity. We were, we received uh, the Frida Prize in 2020, and well, we wanted to thank because we are in this together. Good. So now we invite Christian. Christian, we give you the floor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Christian. I'm a technician of uh, the fiber optic network uh, Soldati Conectada. I'd like to thank uh, 
uh, LACNOG and the Internet Society for making it possible for us to come here to tell you about our experience in this community network in an urban area. As an introduction, let me tell you about Soldati Conectada. It's this, uh, it was created because of a problem that is common in many poor neighborhoods in Buenos Aires, that is connectivity. And I know uh, I, I know what that is because I also live in a, a poor neighborhood that's called Rodrigo Bueno, and until the a couple of years ago, uh, we didn't have any internet, and we are just six minutes away from uh, the uh, um, pink house, the Casa Rosada, the government house, and that shows the marginal, the marginality and the neglected sectors of uh, mm, many neighborhoods in Argentina that lack even the most essential services, including the internet. So. Uh, as we saw this problem in 2020, we received a, a fund uh, from ELACON, that is the Argentine Communications uh, uh, Agency, that, and we uh, submitted a project for Villa Soldati to promote uh, connections. And uh, in uh, uh, late 2020, they approved it, and in early 2021, we started building it. In the slide, you see where we are located, Villa Soldati, that is in Commune 8 to the south of the autonomous city of Buenos Aires, 40 minutes away from the government house. It is 8 kilometers large, and in that 8, eight square kilometers, Villa Soldati has several um, are shanty towns, and we operate in five of them. Barrio Fatima, Barrio Ramon Carrillo, Los Piletones, Barrio Las Palomas, and Barrio La Calacita. So here you have a map. I took this of the National Registry of uh, uh, popular neighborhoods. To the right, you have uh, the number of families in each uh, uh, sector. So that shows that we are about 9,000 families living in those neighborhoods where we operate. Here, Looking at the most technical part, well, we have a G-PON FTTH uh, fiber optic uh, from uh, to from the the um, to the uh, uh, neighbor's house. So we have a, a fiber optic, and uh, to the right you see the equipment that we have. Oh, uh, there you have uh, the descriptions. And then at the center, we have the external plant, uh, uh, the, the passive network that has 12 and 24 filament uh, trunks. And we also have the external part has two levels so that the optic power may meet the parameters requested by the NTOs. And to the right, the the ONTs and then the equipment that we put uh, either at the neighbor's house or the community centers. This is a cross-section of a CTO. Usually, what we t usually do is to put the CTO on the terraces of the neighbors. Well, we always ask for their permission. And we do it like this because of the characteristic of uh, these neighborhoods. The idea is to protect the equipment. In addition to putting a CTO in several places like this, we, we also put an access point with a f internet free of charge uh, for the neighbors. In a, And here I show the number of users that we have at present.
286 members or families connected. We do not address uh, the, our neighbors as clients. We consider them partners because that is the spirit of the network. It's a community. So as an analogy with a, a football team, in a football or soccer team, the people that uh, people are members, they pay on a monthly basis to contribute to their club. So that is more or less the rationale. So, and in addition, the community network does not belong to a single person or to uh, investors or founders, but it belongs to the community. And that is why we say that they are partners or members and not clients. In addition to that, we have 51 community centers that may be schools or um, churches or, um, yeah, or um, and we have 33 APs in a strategic places that, such as uh, the uh, train stations and the uh, street markets, um, and uh, especially on Tuesdays, there are street markets uh, that uh, visited by people of uh, the surrounding neighborhoods. So, and then we get many more users. In addition to the 286 uh, members, we have also uh, hundreds and even thousands of uh, other users. So many more people benefit from our project. Main daily challenges in our operations and deployment for quite some time now. The emergency situation, uh, we have a power emergency situation. We have power cuts and there is fluctuation in the power supply. So this, as a result, leads to the devices uh, burning or we have to be replacing the devices frequently, or also we have to get to support, customer support. Then the posting is very poor, very limited replacement, and th these are the posts, sorry. We had many issues with the posts used for carrying the lines. We ourselves had to replace one of these posts, and it was sort of dangerous. We had to change it ourselves. Then other issues we have that are things we come across on a daily basis, and we try to teach the community how to use these new, new ICTs. So one of the issues is a limited knowledge and digital skills in the community. We therefore organize workshops so as to teach them how to use the digital wallets or an Excel spreadsheet or workshops such as those. Then there are specific cases because this is a neighborhood that has its specificities, such as uh, it's a neighborhood that cannot grow to the sides. It grows upwards. This, this leads to overcrowding, and the Wi-Fi becomes saturated. The 4G communication also provides situations that are very difficult to solve. So what we try to do 
is to teach the neighborhood and the people how to use this. We try to find the best configuration for these devices. And being in a place such as this leads us to having situations like the one we had this summer. Uh, one of the main lines just was interrupted the connection because just a dog felt on that trunk on that line. So this is, these are sort of incredible situations that can happen in communities such as these. So in addition to offering such an essential service in a highly digitalized society, as would be an internet service, we consider that we are like a network that is like a school. So we offer the members of the community, we organize capacity building workshops on fiber optics. With ISOC, we offered a course on technical experts on fiber optics. So 18 members of the community received a certificate and can now work with fiber optics right now. They work uh, for us as trainees. Now we have another cycle with 30 students. We are offering the same course again. And we award a certificate once they finish the course. And yesterday, we learned that we won an IEEE competition with several community networks from all over the world. So we received the first prize. So we feel very proud about this. And somehow is like an acknowledgement, an international acknowledgement, and also from Argentina about this case. So we can share and really see how a community network in an urban area can bear fruit. Thank you, Christian. Congratulations on this award from the IEEE. That's amazing. Congratulations, Christian. And also, if there is anyone from the floor who wishes to ask questions, Christian uh, stepped ahead of me regarding some anecdotes of our daily work, but I'm going to ask Felipe and Hector the same questions. We have some questions from the public which will be surely far better than the ones I can ask. Thomas Lynch, you have a question. Hi, I'm Thomas Lynch from Lacknog. Christian, you told us that you have almost 300 families that are connected. However, this neighborhood is about 9,000 families. What uh, do you need to reach out to more people? We started in 2021. We have a list of future members that is endless. 100, 150, so we have great opportunities to expand the network. Of course, at present, we only have a crew of five people, so that limits the amount of members that we can connect every week, and we also have to provide support at the same time. But every week, we are connecting about 14 further subscribers. And this number of subscribers has probably grown in the meantime. But the equipment we have right now allows us to connect about 3,000 subscribers. So we have a lot of work ahead so as to connect further subscribers. We have two questions in the Zoom. The first question is from Neila Diaz. Who covers the cost of the internet services in these communities? Hector, would you like to answer? First, yes, this is a combination. One of the networks, the cost of one of the networks was paid by the state. 
through uh, internet in public spaces, and we directed this to this community network. This was aimed at putting internet in a square in the city. And this was reconverted, and we built a larger network through that connection. In other cases, this was covered by grants to ensure that the service would be provided over two to three year period. And the communities are also working intensively to collect money and expand the networks. And the same thing happens. The list of people who wish to connect is a very long list. In some cases, they can buy the equipment, so they do the procurement. But in other cases, we're trying to find options to generate local income so that the community can obtain the equipment. The local leadership is very active. And once they are connected to the internet, nobody wishes to lose this option. Filippi, Filippi, would you like to answer your quest the question? How do you pay for these costs, or where do you get the cost, the money to pay for the deployment in your community? Hello. Yes, of course. In the initial three years, we had our own resources. And afterwards, we started to obtain resources through different activities like courses. We now seek to consolidate this partnership in order to have recurring income, in order to develop software, which is the most expensive part in our context. But in order to be able to cover the operational cost, which is quite low, we are trying to support a self-sustainability option through SMS messages in the territory where we are active for reasons that are of a more political nature. We find it difficult to scale this up to further users, so we're trying to work in other territories with uh, a large amount of users so that we can have a better way to obtain income. This is a service is so that the operator that has a community nonprofit network can operate in the network through publicity and self-sustain its operations. In our case, Regarding sustainability, the partners do pay a monthly fee or contribution, always bearing in mind the economic reality of this community. So we pay a minimum amount of money every month for a specific bandwidth. The value is between five to six dollars, and the bandwidth is 10, 20, or 30 megas. Thank you. Second question. I have Filippi behind me, and I turn around and see if he's looking at me in the face, <laughs> but it's an odd feeling. Okay, next question, second question. In the course to develop skills, is a a specific course for users that is related to best practices to take care of the mental and physical health as well as security in order to prevent addiction to the apps. Unfortunately, this might occur by design. So this question is addressed to the Internet Society or to the communities? So let us address the question to the representative of the network, of the community networks. I'm going to, maybe this might not have to do with the operational parts, but we are connecting communities that don't have access to internet in urban communities. They were clearer as to what this was, but in the rural communities or indigenous communities, they're not aware of this. So the first, uh, first I'd like to answer the question. 
So how do we solve the issue of addiction to technology? And this is with filtering. We filter basic things such as pornography, gambling, and those games that are of more destructive nature. Because in fact, we don't have that much bandwidth. So P2P downloads and those sort of things are filtered. Well, of course, the courses also includes conversations with the community, and we get feedback from the parents, particularly regarding the younger people. And we discuss topics. For example, at night, there is uh, people get together at a point of presence to play with the devices and say, well, can I stop public internet from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., for example. This is so that people can really sleep at night. This is a decision that they make as a community, and in fact, they can control things such as those. In a way, that gives them a certain community sovereignty as to the usage of the Internet. That's very interesting. Christian, at present, we do not. We are going to take note of that for a future workshop, too. But yes, initially, we had workshops that informed about uh, the uh, uh, networks to the neighbors, but it would be good to do that. And I'm going to suggest that to our colleagues. Filippi? Well, in the example, in this issue of addictions and restrictions and filters, uh, it is our understanding that in line with uh, the uh, open source uh, software, the technology is available, and each will use it uh, based on uh, their consciousness, and each uh, family will determine uh, the rules, and the, fa uh, the family rules. We leave it open to them to adopt uh, the technologies available, but then people will use it the best way possible. Of course, we try to raise awareness. We uh, try to collaborate so that uh, people will have a better understanding. However, we leave it up to the users. We have another question from the audience. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for um, uh, working to take the Internet to these communities. Now, my question is, how do you measure the results of what you're doing? And this, um, at present, um, are there any positive results that can already be seen? So, the results can be uh, interpreted in many, many ways. Basically, after about two years of uh, operations in our network, we see that we start uh, generating our own uh, digital uh, contents. People develop uh, their own networks and their own uh, digital uh, media. And uh, we need to consider that uh, knowledge transmission, uh, the indigenous transmission of knowledge, is intrinsically um, uh, l limited. Each town, each village have their own language in addition to Guarani. Because in Paraguay, we have two official languages, Guarani and Spanish, as you may already know. But we also have each village may have their own autochthonous uh, languages. So, in these uh, six uh, points, well, only two of them have community networks, although there are more internet points that also feed uh, digital inclusion centers. 
we see many, many different uh, realities. Each town, each village may are at a different level of uh, the uh, appropriation because it takes time. They don't know how to handle things uh, correctly. They they need to be able to, to, to learn how to uh, build their narrative and to express what's happening to them. I don't know whether with that I'm answering your question. Before we go to the next question, we ask those who are raising your hands in Zoom whether you can uh, write down your questions in the panel. This is a question by Oscar Julie Jane Montevideo for any of the participants. Don't you fi uh, find any problems with uh, the internet uh, provide, uh, service providers? Christian? Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we had problems. There are local providers. And that is why we also have limitations, and it's not so easy to uh, expand our services to certain areas in the neighborhoods. But at the beginning, we did have problems, but we did we talked it over, and uh, we try to uh, open the possibility for other neighbors uh, to to access because it's it's a sort of monopoly because the neighbors can't choose for cheaper services so they they need to get used to, to a service that uh, it's no good and it's expensive so we are being constantly begged by people to provide them services it's quite a lengthy process and the uh, neighbors need to uh, get engaged and ask for it. We could also convince uh, the neighbors to strike a balance where we can coexist with the local providers and uh, still provide services to all the neighbors. Yes, but we did have conflicts. Thank you. Yes and no. Yes. First of all, let me explain that this is not the same. We continue to be clients of an ISP. And very often we have access to a population that uh, is uh, is not uh, important for the ISPs because they, these are prepayment uh, clients, most of them four or five dollars per person. So, those who can afford a better service are already doing it, and those who cannot, they come to the community network. So that is the reality at present. In uh, the urban environment, it's a bit different, because in Paraguay, we also try to have our community networks. And as a matter of fact, in Guaida, there's a project that's called Guaida uh, Conectado. And there, we have a bit more problems. I have two more questions. Yes, mine is there is short. I think that the, what the community networks do in remote places is providing a service to community, and I think that they are a monopoly. And uh, it's the only one that's going to provide them services in that area. So my question is, what is the impact of uh, the Starlink antennas or these new satellite services? Have you signed any agreements with the communities for those distant places? That is one. If you want, you can answer that. And then I have a short uh, question there. And the other one is, when is it that a community network will no longer be a community network and, and become an ISP? Because you said that you have 300 families, but actually there's a, uh, there are 9,000. So with 9,000, that's big enough to become an internet provider. So I'd like to know well, the limit. When do you stop being a community network and turn into an ISP? When Starlink is a partner in this case, especially in remote communities, as a matter of fact, there are some points in uh, the 
uh, uh, that are fed by Starlink at present. Obviously, it's no panacea. They, they're, you can't use it for large uh, volumes of data, but you can add different stations so you won't have to uh, establish links between in very long uh, sites. So it's a cost-benefit ratio. And there, I'll give him the floor. Well, the question is a bit difficult. But uh, I think that the community networks are not based on a logic of uh, not belonging to a person, but all of the contributions are destined to maintaining the network and being able to connect as many users, as many um, associates as possible. Because in the end, we are providing them the right to uh, have uh, the internet. They can study, they can do their homework, they can uh, um, do some, uh, uh, and in Argentina, all the e-government, is it's all digital, so the government will tell you that everything is digital, and then there are many, many people that don't have access to the internet, or they don't know how to handle things. Uh, they don't uh, master ICTs. But I think that it's not a matter of uh, numbers, but uh, it's rather applying a rational logic that is to guarantee uh, the uh, right to connectivity of uh, the neighbors of uh, uh, poor, uh, poor neighborhoods. So, Hernan, I think that maybe it's a good thing, and uh, I'll answer from uh, the personal point of view, to integrate the community networks into this uh, discussion. That is what we want. We want them to be part of the discussion. We want them to be part of this forum so that when the local internet policy is being discussed, the networks should be part because they can start with a small scale, but they have a, a huge potential. And now I give Felipe the floor. And somebody is asking here, but I was asked uh, to uh, uh, stop after Felipe finishes and then to leave. Felipe, well, we understand that a community network is no longer a community network, and it is an ISP when it's for profit. We believe in the concept of the social business where we, this is our position. We are not an NGO. We are not, it, it's a community network that is operated by a social business that seeks uh, uh, to have a financial balance. And this should also make it possible not just to provide continuity of the service, but also to keep the scale. I think that that would be the key difference between uh, uh, the uh, community. Uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, for profit. It's not. We are not. The idea is not to put money in the pockets of those that manage the network, but we wanted to impact, to have an impact, a social impact on the network. Well, so thank you. We are, I, I, I have many questions to ask, but we ran out of time. We had a wonderful participation again. I think that the most important thing from our point of view is the possibility that the community networks should be part of this discussion. That is what we tried to do with this session. And we will insist with uh, these sessions at other meetings that we do it all over the world. So I want to thank the participants and all of you. See you next time. We want to thank the members of the panel, Hector Felipe and Felipe and Christian, and uh, our chair, Sebastian, for uh, discussing uh, these uh, challenges of the community networks. Now we'll have a coffee break. That well, we have half.